Is making money the most important thing to us? No, actually, it isn't. Episode 174. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Michelle Cohen and Cindy Waters, the co founders of Waters Cohen. So Michelle studied architecture in South Africa and moved to London, setting up Waters and Cohen with Cindy in 1994. Cindy was born in Australia. She also studied in South Africa. That's where her and Michelle began their nearly 40 year plus relationship. Uh, She moved into London in 1990. Originally, she was working at Fosters and Partners and then She met back up with Michelle and they co-founded Walters Cohen. So the practice has developed a portfolio of public, educational, commercial, housing and cultural projects. They've won uh, work through recommendations, through repeat business and through a number of competitions. And they have positioned themselves as one of the UK's and the world's leading education designers. In 2012, Cindy and Michelle were awarded the inaugural AJ Woman Architect of the Year Award and have been on the judging panel of subsequent awards. Michelle is one of the Design Council's associates. She regularly examines and lectures at universities, speaks at conferences and judges awards. And in 2020, she was made an honorary professor of architecture in the Department of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Nottingham. Cindy regularly contributes to academic and professional institutions as an external examiner and guest lecturer. She has been on the Lepecken Prize Jury, the Sterling Prize Jury, and a judge for the President's Research Awards for the RABA. In 2019, Cindy became chair of the Architecture Foundation, and she's also one of the Design Council's associates, and she regularly judges at the World Architecture Festival. In this episode... We discuss the origins of Waters Cohen, how their relationship began and how they set up the practice and the way they were winning work in the early days compared to how they win work now. We also discuss the changing procurement landscape in the UK and in particular around education and the new challenges it presents both for them as an established practice and for younger practices. And we also discuss the importance of establishing a mission focused company ethos and culture that nurtures, attracts, develops, and retains talent. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Michelle Cohen and Cindy Waters. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Michelle and Cindy, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Absolute pleasure to be here just on, where are we? We're just on the edge of Kentish Town. Yeah. Brilliant. And we're in Camden, yeah. And how long have you guys been based here? Since 2015. Five. 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 2005, we moved in here. Yeah. Yeah. So Cindy and I um, decided we were a bit fed up with paying people rent. Yep. And we bought the building. Um, and yeah, it was on the election night, 2005. 2005. And we, yeah. well, and that and we couldn't actually find anywhere to rent. So <laughs> this came up and we, we looked at it and we thought, we actually sent somebody who worked for us out to kind of find us a new office space because we were about to have to leave our previous space. And she said, I can't really find anywhere suitable to rent, but I found this place that's for sale. And we, we were, everyone was saying, don't buy commercial property. And we, we came and looked at it and we thought, Wow, it's kind of perfect. So yeah. It feels like mm. a nice home. Yeah. Amazing. And where were you based before? Just up the road in Highgate Studios, just, okay. on, High, just on Highgate Road. Great. And before yeah. that, we were in Clerkenwell. We started our practice in Clerkenwell. We shared offices with a, a, a firm of architects who no longer exist called Monk and Beck and Marshall. Um, and we, we, a friend of ours worked for them. And he said, oh, I think they might have some spare desk space. So we, we took a desk space... Well, we had we had four tables kind of pushed together at the front of the office. It was a space smaller than this. Smaller than this, yeah, yeah much smaller actually. Yeah, and um, 
and we had we started there, and then we we actually had employed our first two members of staff when we just sort of we were getting sick of having to say, "Excuse me, can you just budge in so I can get past to go to the printer or the loo yeah. or <laughs> anything, anything?" Yeah. And we so we moved we to moved rented up. space in in Highgate okay. Studios, and so, so this this was the sort of beginning of beginning the of the nineties, ninety four, ninety four, yeah. Yeah, and and had you guys been working with each other previously? How did that? How did the partnership begin? So it actually it goes back a lot longer than that because Cindy and I um, met our first day um, of university, and um, so South we Africa. went in mm. South Africa in Durban, uh, and we were um, so we we had our whole kind of university mm. career together. Um, first day of first year. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. It is. Yeah. yeah. And we and we were actually we started working together, not, maybe not in first year, but quite soon after that we would you know kind of play off each other's strengths yeah. and and so that kind of started from the beginning. I'll tell you what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we often used to work together at, for exams, and that's it's a wonderful thing. And I can remember so well. Do you remember going? We'd work in the morning, and then we'd have sleep. lunch, and then we'd sleep <laughs> for the rest of the day. <laughs> Sleeping. A lot of sleeping Lots took of place. Sleeping. Yeah. But actually, but it was even good. I broke my arm in first year. I fell off a horse and broke my um, shoulder. And I, I had a license, and Michelle had a. No, I had the, the, I had the license. You I had, had the, the car. provisional license. But <laughs> yeah. I had the car. You had the car. So I couldn't drive because I had a broken arm. So I would sit in the driver's seat and you would change gear yes, I just, but, but it was all legal because I had it the license legal, so it just wasn't very, Cindy had very sensible so she would go okay change <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so so that kind yeah. of um, collaboration I think well, yeah I'm, I'm imagining that's quite a good sort of um, symbol or, or metaphor for the for the partnership <laughs> I, I think it probably <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and so what what makes a good long lasting partnership because it's like a marriage yeah. and it can be we spend a lot more time with each other than we do <laughs> the people we married to um, yeah uh, what makes a good partnership I, I think I think some of that kind of early kind of relationship that isn't based on a business partnership mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you begin to know someone and you don't necessarily agree with everything they say and you don't but actually because the relationship has been there for so long it it is pretty solid and you will find a way through even if I'm so upset and mm -hmm. I'm so it's, it actually doesn't really matter because what's yeah. more important is um, that we you know the business is strong and for the business to strong be strong, we need to be working well together. Um, I, mean, so I, I suppose think yeah, that. it is. I mean, like in that sense, it is like a marriage. Mm. That, you know, you take a long term view, mm -hmm. and and I think you know at the end of the day, as you know, whatever's going on in the day to day, whatever's going on in the detail, whatever might be, you know, irritating you or making you happy, I know that. You know, the one person I can completely one hundred percent rely on is Michelle. Mm. And if it and if it goes up and Giovanni, who's you know, who's who's our, our third partner. Mm. But and that's kind of that sort of bond family, I don't know. I, I think it's quite unusual. I, I think, you know, lots of people are in partnerships that, you know, are just business partnerships. Yeah. And you know, they oh and that and ours is essentially a business partnership. Um but it you know, it it was based on a friendship to start with. And and there's been a lot of history as well. Mm. You know, we've been, we started first year 40 years ago, which is a scary thought. So, you know, it's uh, it, it's been a long time, yeah. a, a lot more than you know, most of our lives. Um, so it is like, in that way, it's much more of a, a you know, a, a, a partnership, a, pro a true partnership. Ha has it has it always been one where both of you have complemented each other's skill sets, or have you ever felt like actually we're you know we're two the same, or has it always been kind of nice nicely balanced like that? I think actually it's always been a complementary thing, um, yeah. and um, and that actually probably helps make it work. I think mm. in, in the beginning <laughs> it was when we were really tiny. You know, when we were like just a handful of people, yeah. it started off just Michelle and I, and then we had a couple more people, and then a couple more. But it, it built up quite gradually. I think in, it, when and then we suddenly got quite busy and big, 
Um, so when we moved into this big, I mean big for us, when we moved into this building, we, we left Target Studios, we were 12 cool. people. Yeah. So when we moved in here, we were 12. And then suddenly, you know, we, we grew to 30 mm-hmm. quite quickly. And then I think, you know, just practically, we, you know, we had to run our own jobs and deal with our own clients. And that's, you know, just was it just a logistic thing more than anything else. But, I mean, we still, you know, check in all the time. We, mm. we, have, we have office meetings every other Monday. Mm. And, you know, we have meetings, you know, directors meet. We have all kinds of ways that we can check in with each other, you know, including WhatsApp and all sorts of other handy things. And just so, sitting and saying, this is on my mind. Yeah, exactly. You know, which actually is the most important yeah. kind of meeting. And I think, I mean, you come back to kind of has it always been like this? I think this kind of, I, I do, it is a family kind mm. of thing, um, is, is very much part of our office ethos. Um, and whether we did it intentionally, I don't know, but it's, I think it probably came from the fact that we were first friends. Yeah. Mm. And we, you know, and so that is, you know, that's the way we feel about our office. This is an extended family. Mm. And, and I suppose also the other thing is that we didn't go to university here. So mm. we didn't go to school or university here. So we didn't have that network of people, mm. family here. Our families were in other parts of the world. We didn't have a network of people that we'd met here at university who perhaps could have been, you know, connected us to potential clients. So we've, we've always sort of been foreigners as well, you know, and, and that's kind of interesting. So I suppose we were that kind of family connection was more important to us yes. than it might have otherwise been. So, yes, I guess that, that's a pretty big life-changing experience, both of you relocating to the UK. Mm. Well, how did that come about? What was the, the some of the drivers that had you not set up practice in South Africa? Well, I mean, I'm going to show I may have diff- different reasons, but mine, you know, I we'd both graduated and... South Africa really wasn't a very nice place at the end of the 80s. Yeah. It was, in fact, a very horrible place. And I just knew, I always knew that I had to get out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I didn't, we didn't know what was going to happen politically. Um, I just knew that I, I, we both spent our year out here in London and just loved it. And um, I just, I don't know, I suppose I felt for the first time living in London in a, as a year out student that I found somewhere I could actually, I wanted to live. Um, you know, I just, I didn't know places like London existed, you know, and um, I just, it felt right to me. And I just always knew that I wanted to come back here. Mm. Um, so, but having said that, I came back thinking, oh, it'll be nice to go back to London for a year or two, you know, and then I'd go home, home being South Africa. Um, although I was born in Australia, so it's a kind of long, complicated story. <laughs> but I, I never, didn't ever really seriously ever consider leaving, having having come back here. And then you get married and have children and, yeah. and start a practice. So, so it wasn't, well, you didn't necessarily come together. No. No, no but you ended up kind of Cindy. reconnecting back in yeah. London. Yeah, Cindy came a couple of years before I did. Um, and I think by, why did we come? We came because for me, my dad was English, mm-hmm. British. Um, I had kind of grown up with London, in my opinion, was the centre of the universe because kind of that's what we, you know, not that my dad loved London, he really didn't. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, it, all the books we were reading were from the UK, all of, you know, all of those kind of things. And so I, when I came, it was, it was with my my husband. Um, I, I stayed and worked in South Africa for th- three years after we graduated. Um, got some a lot of very good building experience because they build very quickly in South Africa. Um, and then came over, and we came over because John, my husband, was doing an MBA, and we thought, where should we go and do an MBA? Um, didn't want to stay in South Africa because the same reasons that Cindy, you know, mentions that this was end of the 80s it was a bit oh where this is where is this going we thought you know what we had absolutely no intention of immigrating mm. but we thought let's go and get have an experience somewhere else and London was just the perfect place so we got we got here um, in 1990 
and um, we set up Balston Cohen in 1994. And I, by that stage, was I already at Foster's at that stage? I think I was, wasn't you were, I? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and then, so I was at Foster's for four years, I think, four years. And then we just started kind of, you know, saying, Neither of us wanted, we, we've, I think we both knew we weren't the sort of people who wanted to work for other people forever. Yeah. We just, I, I, it had never occurred to me that I wouldn't one day have my own practice. Um, and, um, and then we just thought, we were, we were both under 30, we just thought, you know, must it, why, why wait? You know, um, there was a recession. We were probably, we didn't really realise it at the time, but we were probably coming out of one of the worst recessions mm-hmm. that yeah. this country's ever had. Um, arguably a good time to start a practice because you become, you know, I suppose you have to be a bit more resourceful. We didn't know that either. We didn't know, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know anything, let's be honest. <laughs> we were, we, we just kind of thought, in fact, we actually said to each other, all right, let's just give this a go. Give it a year. Give it a year. Pff, See what happens. Um, it, you know, if it doesn't work out, we'll go back to the day job. I mean, quite literally. Yeah. Um, and we had all kinds of grand ideas about we, had, we were going to have a restaurant. Yeah, and, oh, I still want a restaurant. And um, <laughs> we were going to do all kinds of weird, wonderful yeah. things. But you know, once you once you sort of get sucked into practice, it's uh, it's quite a difficult, quite difficult to, to sort of then open a restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I suppose also the maybe the other different and maybe the other sort of thought following on from the fact that we didn't go to university here, we didn't go to school here, we didn't have a network of friends and family who could kind of support us here, was that we we kind of knew that we, it was a sort of sink or swim moment, you know, mm. we knew that we had to build um, and we had to build up a reputation, we had to build up a portfolio, um, but we didn't have the, you know, we, we really just had to kind of put our heads down and work. Yeah. But we didn't have the connections in the academic world to actually no. be able to support, yes. you know, support ourselves that way, which a lot of people do. Um, but I, what we did have, which we were quite lucky about, is by that stage, um, my, my husband had finished the MBA, Cindy's husband is a dentist. So mm. we did have the luxury of not having to um, bring money in yeah. uh, for a couple of months. Mm. Um, and... Uh, and that was a luxury because I think it must be very hard trying to set up a business um, if you are trying to kind of have to pay the bills. Feed the family. family. Yeah, yeah, well, I think uh, it's really hard. Absolutely. And I, I um, think that we see that a lot with, with younger, younger mm. practices and then there might be the knee-jerk reaction of just taking on whatever project whatever comes, along, comes along as soon exactly. as that happens. Or, and quite a lot teach because that's a source yeah. of income. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I think we, we never wanted to... We just... We were too women, we mm-hmm. were young, uh, we were foreign, we were foreign, <laughs> we didn't have that network of connections, we were told at the time that, you know, it would never work, um, I, we've been told, and I, I always hesitate to say this because someone will tell me I'm wrong, but we, you know, we've been, we were told that we were the first two women to start a practice in the, an architectural practice in the UK, uh, we both and found, keep going at the time. <laughs> and I think that's <laughs> the case. Lots, lots, lots and lots of stuff. You know, you know, husband and wife teams or male-female yeah. partnerships or group partnerships yeah. that include women. But, you know, we someone said introduced us that way when we gave a lecture years ago. And I, I we both thought, oh, that can't be right. And then we've sort of spent ages trying to disprove this theory and and haven't been able to. So obviously it's Grafton in, in Ireland, but they're not in the UK. Yeah. Um, and there's been lots of uh, there's been lots of cooperatives that have been mainly, you know, all female. But we, you know, we were told by this, you know, the Glasgow School of Art that we were the first two women to start a practice. So it was pretty unusual. You know, we were we were young foreign um, female. And, 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 you know, we knew that we needed to just build mm. so that we could get stuff published. We mm. could get that, you know, just start to get a, a name for ourselves. Um, and we started off doing predominantly two types of project, um, all working for developers, strangely. One was uh, health clubs, which were right. the, the ra- all the rage, mm. and the other was day nurseries. And we did loads of... So we basically worked for two clients... Um, and our accountant said to us, 
yeah. don't like this. To diversify. You know, one of this. One of these clients just has to go, yeah. you know, stop building or stop commissioning you and you're going to be in trouble. So we thought, okay, what else do we know how to do? Oh, we know how to design. Um, so let's design, let's enter competitions. Mm -hmm. So we just started in, and, and we'd won a competition yeah. in our very first year of practice mm -hmm. because back in South Africa, it was an international competition. You were only, you were invited to enter by submitting a, a, a sort of half page statement demonstrating that you understood the local climate which we both did. Yeah. Um, and we entered that competition and we won and we built a building, um, which is quite, and very quickly. Within, I um, think within, from submission to opening, it was 15 months. Something like wow. that. It was it crazy. It was incredible. You know, most yeah. competitions here, you might win and then someone will, you know, you'll be told, oh, we've got to raise the money or whatever. They Two were years like, later. We like, literally won. Later. And, and on Monday, I think we got a fax, that's how long ago it was, saying, where, where are, are you? you? <laughs> like, like, where are you? Uh, well, I'm in London. Um, <laughs> So it, it was, that was brilliant. And that, that was our first opportunity to get something pub built, mm -hmm. then published. And, and us, you know, it was the first time we had an article published in the, like a major mm. architectural journal. So it was published in the, yes. in the so, architectural yeah. so, so the first work that you were doing was commission, uh, um, commercial work. Commercial. You, did, you, you didn't go down the residential route that so, so many we architects had, we had, yeah. So we had a, we, we kind of, you know, it's like, what do you do when you start out? And we, there were only two things we said we didn't want to do. The one was work from our own home. Mm. And, and the other one was to do residential extensions. Right. For family. For a family, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, for, for anyone. Mm. But, and over time, we, the, the one or two have crept in. Sure. Um, but we were quite clear that that didn't, wasn't going to be... And, and that we wanted to run an office that... No had, working and, out of our front room and no back extensions. Yeah. No, um, we, did do, we didn't ever well, work out of our front, front room, room, but we did do a fair, amount of, a fair number of back extensions uh, over the years. But the, but the first projects weren't that, actually. The first projects were um, the nurseries and a, a quite a large residential building. And then we very quickly got into the health clubs through a kind of people who knew people. Mm -hmm. Through a residential project, Just through a residential actually. Project. Um, it, you know, a, a, a project that we did for a client who was a developer. Um, and he just sold it for a ridiculous amount of money, which he wasn't expecting. And then he just thought we were amazing yeah. because we'd sold he'd sold these apartments for like so much more than he was expecting to. So after that, he just gave us <laughs> they gave us gave all us their work, work, and they owned um, a chain of a health chain clubs. Of health right. But actually, just getting into that, I remember. I mean, how we met. Um, that the person. Client. <laughs> um, we, you know, what we did was we we kind of contacted all the consultants that we had worked with in the ever. Ever, ever, really, ever. And there was one QS who came along and said, oh, I have a client who has a very small little project and they want to want to design their front doors and of the of an insurance company, like literally their yes. front doors. Goodness Remember. Me. And it was, but it's complex because of these kind of visibility, but they're fire issues and they're access issues. We said, no, we'll do that. But it was a, it was a large kind of glazed front screen with doors. And it was that that, that got us into um, the, um, the housing in, in uh, just off Sloan Square. Mm. So just, you never and, know. There was yeah. another, another funny little seam of work that we had, which was, we were because we were in this other these other architects' offices. Um, yeah. They every now and then, if they were too busy, you know, they they would sort of give us some work to do. So actually, some of the first work we ever did was basically doing their work mm -hmm. for them. And then we, the client, that client, kind of quite liked working with us. And then we did a couple of projects just you know on our yes. own for that client by agreement. By agreement, yeah. yeah. You know, not we didn't kind of steal no, them no, away. It was never. It was always. Mm. I mean, they were those architects were very honest with their clients. Like, we'll take it on. We don't have the work, but these guys will do it. So it was a very, it was a very good relationship, and we were very, very grateful for it. And do you remember when we got that first check? <laughs> <laughs> and that's we got got a check. Do you remember when you got paid checks? <laughs> and we, just we, said, we took oh, our husbands God. out for dinner. We've got money. <laughs> <laughs> it was and, amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. And then and then we bought our first computer. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. But the um I think the the what what the thing I've 
reflected on quite a lot lately is the fact that you know when we started we were basically only working for developers we were working for the guys that did the health clubs we were working for the guys that did the residential developments um, and we but were the working nurseries for the weren't develop developers they were they were oh, they, they were, were kind of part of developers well they they, they built they? their own they built their own nurseries yeah, but so they, they were, were I mean I suppose what I mean is they were commercial mm. they were all you know commercial clients I suppose everyone's a commercial client but we decided so then we won this one competition for the for the art gallery in South Africa and we thought oh you know, we'll be doing art galleries for, forevermore <laughs> um, and we didn't do another art gallery for a long time, long time. Um, yeah. until I think the, the next art gallery we actually completed yeah. was in 2008 so it was quite a long like time later yeah. and, um, and we, in the meantime we did a lot of other competitions which we didn't win and but we did but, lots that we did win, actually. Yeah, and there was a, we. That's exactly so. We just decided, okay, what else can we do with these? Our accountants telling us we've got to be careful because all these guys could be a bit. Um, they could all just disappear, mm-hmm. and diversify. we won't have a business. And mm-hmm. he said you need to diversify, and so mm-hmm. we we started doing competitions, and we did the first competition we did. Uh, the first competition we did in this country, we didn't win. Um, that we was made a, some incredible. We made some very powerful, powerful ally, ally, friends. Friends. and friends. Um, yeah, that was that was kind of a, a, a shocking moment for us because we we I think everyone who was involved in the competition thought we should have won, but it wasn't it it wasn't the right thing for right. whatever reason. So um, the we decided. Well, so that that was just a kind of an interesting. It was the end of the 90s. End of the 90s. And mm. one of the jury members, who we're still in contact with, came up to us afterwards and said, we were sort of licking our wounds mm. in the corner, um, <laughs> having been told we were the runners-up. And he said, oh, grow up. Yes. He said, yeah. <laughs> he said you, I've just come second, second eight times to Richard Rogers, yeah. And I, we were like, okay. Really? <laughs> okay. Um, so that was kind of fun, and yeah. then um, so we we learned how to take coming second on the chin. Yeah. Um, and then the next one we won, and then we won a lot of competitions. You know, we won we won. I don't know. I think our hit rate was like one in three or something at one yeah. stage. And were these competitions in in lots of different types of sectors? Were you and what, yeah. was there any sort of strategy a lot to them? The, 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 mostly, uh, mostly no, education. They started. They didn't start in education, but they moved towards education. So. In, it was like the end of the 90s when our, when our, it was when our accountant said you've got to diversify that we sat down actually as an office and we said what are the sectors we want to be working in and we chatted mm. about it and um, interestingly enough education, although we had been working in early years but education was, well, well education sounds as if it's quite a good place to be and, and somewhere that we had probably enjoy and like like doing and um and so we did by hook or by crook um start entering um competitions that were largely education right. and the first, I think the first ones the, the first major ones that we won were all education and then we won a housing one yeah that and was, we won that was a, 2001 we won a leisure one to redevelop a swimming pool yeah and they were they, they were a mix of competitions they were, they were, right. they were, uh, they were but they were you know, um, I suppose they were they were all either RIBA or you know. Then then later on we started doing more when we built up a bit of a reputation as being you know for being and uh, we were more known in the education sector. We started there started to be more invited competitions. Right. But Until then, they were all open or open mm. or you know yeah. So, so you've, you've you've seen the education industry then shift in the way that, in the way that they actually procure architects and absolutely and, and yeah. Do in fact, work. we've we've you know you um, we're almost seeing it back again like twenty plus years ago, right. and it's amazing to see mm. to think that we've seen <laughs> this evolution yeah. um, of the sector. And the other thing that we were we were desperate to do, apart from just work in education, was work in in, in the state sector. Right. So we, you know, we were the first couple of projects we won were in, in for independent, independent schools. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, although the very first one technically isn't an independent school, but we're not no. allowed to mention names, no. so we can't tell you which one that was. No. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, then the, then we were were shortlisted for a big project for the DFES, and that became. 
Well, yeah. we we were we weren't we we were one of the teams in, selected in we were the building schools yeah. building schools the future initiative, yeah. and um, there were eleven teams mm. who were selected, and we were to- actually. I remember thinking, why didn't we get a secondary school? We should have got a secondary school, but actually we got a primary school to des- design, and it was at the right thing for us at the time, mm. and that was brilliant mm. because that opened. Another, um, it just allowed us to do some research, some really fundamental research around yeah. what was happening in education, the trends, what technology was going to be doing to our built, you know, the built environment. It's quite it's visionary, amazing, really. I mean, the, 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 that period of time was about six months, about a six month period that we were paid mm-hmm. to yeah. do, to, re, to just research school design. And you know, and, and come up with the design, and that was to, yeah. amazing. That was yeah. a, that, that's that's quite a, yeah, that's visionary. A, yeah. Do you know, I still look mm. back at those eleven schools that were designed, and I still think they were very very they, they would stand, visionary. They would stand up now mm. to what was going on, and and the the Labour government because it was a Labour government sure. initiative. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> um, I thought they were totally. It, it was like that's mm. how you change. It, it, you, you have a groundswell of change. Mm. But there was this acknowledgement that the, the estate, yeah. you know, the, the education state was in very poor, you know, it was in a very poor state. And we, and, you know, something quite urgent needed to be done. Mm. And so they weren't all new buildings, and you know, quite a lot of them, most of them, in fact, were refurbishments or mm-hmm. ad- adding some new buildings to an existing estate. But it was a, it was a proper long-term vision plan of investment in the education state. We're now full circle working with it back in the state sector with schools that have absolutely no idea where to get the funding from. Yeah. You know, so it's um yeah, it's I, an interesting time. So, so, so I think though that that wasn't so sorry, I, I think what they did, I think they were so clever, is they knew that they needed to rebuild the estates, as you're saying, but mm. they tied that up with transformational education. Yeah. Right. So and that was the, the kind of cleverness of that. So it wasn't about a building program, it was about transforming education. And my goodness, if we look at the last twenty years. It's a very different focus. And yeah. and think we and we the sadness is that we've stopped transforming in this mm. country. Um, and we, we need to get back to that because other people you know, we, for many years until kind of the early kind of two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve we, the UK was considered the forerunner of, of absolute building, you know, what, what really exemplary school environments mm. should look and feel like. And now we've been overtaken left, right. We and were being, in, you know, we were being invited to Finland, you know, mm. to come and talk to the Finnish government mm. about how to do a buildings pro, a, a school building program. You know, it was a, it was a, it was a time. It was kind of our day in the sun. Yeah. Um, but and it didn't last. But our, our last building schools for the future project finished and was opened in 2012, so 10 years ago. And um, actually, they just called yesterday. It was quite sweet. They called yesterday. I haven't even had a chance to tell Michelle to ask us to go back and do a a, a workshop with their senior leadership team um, to make sure that they are using the building in the way that it was kind of conceived. Right. That they make it, they're getting the best use out of it in terms of how they're using all the kind of interme- you know, in, in interstitial spaces, not not just the classrooms, but um, and the landscape, the indoors, the outdoors, the the kind of the spaces that were always intended as as collaborative working mm. spaces. They were just saying we don't think we're using these spaces as best we could, and I said you. Well, you I didn't say you're definitely not. But, um, <laughs> so it's like a they, tune-up. Yeah, like, exactly. Like a recalibration. Yeah. It was so really nice. That, that was so nice, nice that they, they came, came back, back to us. And they came said, back, could you, yeah. could you just come and explain your thinking to us? Mm. Uh, which is, is I'm really looking forward to. So, so, so that, that kind of shift in the philosophy around education, how have you seen that manifest itself in the way that educational buildings are now procured? And, and what are some of the challenges oh. that have started to emerge because it's really fascinating to hear you know and it's so interesting to hear practices 20 years ago entering competitions being innovative being able to experiment and winning work whereas today the climate seems very very different very very cautious hyper conservative risk averse Mm. and there's always somebody trying to you know 
put the architect into some sort of box or be very, very controlled in terms of fees? and as a prescriptive. The, the procurement actually... Um, f- so at the moment, we're not doing um, any of the kind of national... We're not on any of the national frameworks for building schools. Um, and partly um, by choice, I think. Right. Um, because we're not sure that we can add value because of the prescriptive nature of what's going on. It is changing. Mm. Um, and, for instance, we were, we were considered, I don't know, probably about a year ago now, it's probably, um, where they, they, they wanted to look at the impact of biophilic design and sustainability on the design of, of schools. Um, and I think, that, I think there is... The problem is, while money is short they will continue to be incredibly prescriptive because it's moved away from a transformational educational program to just, and we've got schools that are crumbling, you know, yes. they're crumbling. Yeah. Yeah. So we just need to rebuild them and you need to just, you know, that like here's a stand, the couple of standard layouts, that's the one with some tweaks, that's what you're going to get. And I just, it, it doesn't give us much joy. Um, it does. We we can't really add value. I think it'll make us really frustrated. Yeah. Um, and so um, and and actually, we would make them frustrated. I think that's the, the equally you know because there's so much we can do, mm-hmm. but when you are constrained to the extent that it, that they are being, I don't think um, you know we would be giving them ideas that they, they couldn't do. That. So, so that's that's really interesting as as the evolution of the practice where there's this quite a core body of you know, unique knowledge and specialism and experience delivering in a certain sector. Where do you, what do you do with it now? How does it get evolved or, or directed, if you like? Yeah, so I think one of the reasons why education um, attracted us so much was that um, in the state sector, we want to be working there. In the independent sector, um, if they are building a swimming pool or a gym, it's a jolly good swimming pool and a jolly good gym or a theatre or a music venue or, you know. So actually, while we are in the, that sector, we are getting experience and we have built a right. portfolio around, well, we've done this theatre and we've done that and we've, you know. But so, not, not just building different building types, as Michelle's explaining. So not just, you know, a wonderful performing arts building or a wonderful sports building, but just, you know, also very different contexts. So Greenbelt... Mm. Um, back edge of pavement in central London, um, historic, you know, in, in historic history. Building cathedral yeah. precincts. Yeah. You know, it's mm. it's a huge range of different sites and different contexts with completely different sort of challenges. So that that within one sector, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of variety. Mm. But you know, just um, so that that's one of the, the reasons that we, you know, we like it, and we've also gone. You know, we've also gone from sort of early years all the way through to university. Right. So we're now we're now starting. Well, quite it's quite some years ago now we started working in in the university sector, and that's really exciting because there's you know uh, that there's a there's a lot going on, and there's a there's a big discussion about the future of universities, what the pandemic has done to university education. There's a whole you know there's now a, a need for some real kind of research and thinking around hybrid learning and all of those those things that you know everybody's talking about. So that's that's really interesting. But you know just coming back briefly to your procurement question, you know, this is the I think and unle- until there is a shake up of procurement, proper a proper shake up of mm. procurement that puts quality more central to the procurement process. We aren't going to, you know, we just there's it's going to be very difficult to commission the right kind of buildings in the state sector. The one thing about about the Building Schools for the Future program is that's exactly what it did. Mm. Yeah. It was very aspirational, you know, in terms of not just um, transformational education, but also environmental sustainability. Um, for its time. For its time. Yeah. And I'm, I think, I hope, my hope is that our the, where we are going with the circular economy, with... Um, embodied carbon with our sustainability targets and the UK is pretty good in, you know, in the world it'll force a rethink around procurement and quality 
um, because it's, you know, that conversation just hasn't happened. It's Everything's just driven down to the bottom line, mm. you know, to the, the cheapest possible solution. And that's never going to give you, you know, a, a, a great building estate. Nobody ever delivered great cities by, you know, cheapest, quickest. driving it down yeah. to the lowest I common mean, denominator. The building schools of the future had, um, had taken it, so far in that they they had written into their procurement that unless it got approval by CABE, which, and that was an external um, body, you know, looking at the, the design, that um, you couldn't submit it for planning. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, you know, that was amazing because... There was a you know, schools were review amazing. panel. Amazing. You know. Yeah, I was, I was on that review panel. And, Incredible. And we, you know, we were seeing these amazing schools come, come through. And then, of course, 2008 happened, and then the, the, the whole Building Schools of the Future program was well, The government cut. changed, and then, yeah, yeah, and then one of the control. first things that went was CABE. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, CABE was, yeah. we were just about to get minimum space standards, you know, to get a, a set of proper space standards for school design. That never happened. So there's a, I don't know, there was just, but the fact that there was a design review panel mm. for schools, it was a separate one for mm. hospitals, you know, there was a, there was a, a, a vetting process mm. on the quality of the design, you know, and the, and it, it was extraordinary. Mm. I mean, there was a, there was a. It's a shame that 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 second pair of eyes is is no longer there. That independent, that yeah, independent body. But I think procurement, yeah, procurement is is a problem for us um, because we do have an awful lot to add yeah. still in the state sector, and we are still working. In the state sector, but not through the big national frameworks, right. but through individual schools or local authorities who um, are, are you know, running their own internal competitions um, to find people that they feel will design extraordinary schools for them. And it's we've got to be careful. There's not, they don't have money sloshing around. Sure. But they don't, you know, they are invariably putting the funding up for these new schools rather than getting central government funding. So, and, and I think we've got to, you know, back to another point you made, you know, we've got to try and make it easier mm. for younger practices to actually get work. Um, you know, it's 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 very difficult. I mean we we are a practice that have been going a long time now, 27 years or something. We are um, we still at least once a week, you know, we'll look at the requirements for a project and it'll say, you know, you look you look for what we call the killer question, mm. you know, and it'll be, we'll have to submit three case studies, all in the sector, all delivered in, in, the in the last five, five years, years. <laughs> all within the same sort of budgetary, you know, yeah. range. Unless you're actually a big practice, mm. you're very unlikely to be able to tick any of those boxes. So, so for the smaller practices, unless you're a client that doesn't need to rely on any form of public procurement, or you don't have to comply with any form of public procurement, you can't, you know, we, a practice like ours, you know, around 30 people, able, proven track record of delivering quite large, complex buildings, mm -hmm. um, we, we won't get a look in. And, mm -hmm. other pract and many other practices, smaller than us, wouldn't either. So, you know, until we were actually making it possible for younger, talented people to start their own practices and win work, unless, without having to rely completely on commercial developers, which is what some of them do. You know, it's, um, I, don't, I think we've got, well, how, got some how, work to do there. How, how, how do you go about winning work outside of framework agreements and how has your, your methods of winning work evolved or changed? Have we ever won any work through a framework agreement? Yeah. Um, Not much. We've been on several frameworks. We've been on several. I mean, we don't know. Um, but they, but they, we've won very little. We've done very, won very little to the extent yeah. that we now look at these frameworks and just think. The problem, the, the difficulty is that the framework, the people who assess the framework don't, don't value quality. Mm. And they, this is a tick boxing exercise and we don't tick all those boxes. So I think it's like a really hard lesson to learn. Maybe we just, at the moment, those frameworks are just not, not good for us. How do we go about winning work out of those frameworks? It's really hard. But it's hard in the frameworks as well, right. you know, because you've, you, it's not like you get you on a framework and the work just starts work, right. Yeah. They don't because you're still in competition. So you've still got to, and that competition then is usually about the, your lowest fees. And we, we are not about lowest fees. 
and um, and I don't believe we ever will be. We're not highest fees, but that's that's not where we peg ourselves. Mm. Um, winning work, lots of invited competitions, lots and lots of invited competitions, an enormous amount of client referrals. Repeat work. And repeat, repeat, but or, you know, so-and-so, um, you know, you've done a really good job for them, they recommend you, can you come and have a look? Even then, there's always an element of competition. Yeah. So it's not just, yeah, it's, you know, just give it to you. Almost or, never. I loved the one the other day. So we got a client called up and they said, oh, this was a big project, lovely, potential, amazing. I said, where did you, <laughs> where did you get our name? And she said, this woman said, oh, I've got someone to kind of check best school architects in the world. And your name popped up. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So, I mean, you know what? The, the issue is it's an awful lot of schoolwork. It's a, what, what we need. And we've been trying. We're at, at university now. It's becoming more, we've been becoming quite well known. Um, but what we really, there are a couple of other sectors that we we need to, A, get into, mm. Um or, or begin to kind of woo, and they're hard. It's really hard, it's even with an pra- established practice like ours. When, when you identify like a new sector to move into, and like you're diverse mm. in the portfolio, or even within, say, education, and you, you, you know that there's certain clients that you want to be working with, what sorts of, how do you go about facilitating that? Is it just kind of you're waiting for referrals or do you sit down and be strategic and say, you know what, well, well, we, we should be working with these people and then you map out a bit plan to get there. Bit 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 we, we, so we do a number of things. We, we would look for, we would speak to people like the person who helps us with our PR about finding out, you know, who's, who to talk to. Um, we do our own research. Um, we would might try and find a competition to do in that sector because even though we might not be able to tick all the boxes, it gives us the opportunity to just think mm. about, you know, let's say it's, um, I don't know, sheltered accommodation or whatever it might be. We would, you know, it gives us an opportunity to think about what it is that we might be able to contribute and what we think the design issues really are. Um, and, you know, if we don't win that competition, we might win the next one. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how we approach it. Um, we, um, there are also the odd one-off kind of projects that we win that you know where we don't tick any boxes mm. because we, we haven't got the right experience. But you just go into, you know, they might often be asking you to demonstrate an approach, mm. and they just like what you say and think we'd like to work with these people. So, um, but our I, I think it, it's a kind of a double-edged sword being in being well known in a particular sector. Yeah, because you know. I was talking to a planning, uh, a head of a planning department, a very well-known one, uh, some years ago, and he said, you know, the best architects have to generalize, specialize in order to generalize. Mm. And um, and I thought that was a kind of a nice way of putting it, because if you, you need to learn your craft, you know, you need to get, um, to build enough that you've got a, a portfolio of work and that you, you know, when you go into an interview, you really know what you're talking about. Um, but then that's also slightly a curse when people think, well, you only do schools or mm. you only do this or you only do that. So um, I think we've always tried to have a little bit of a, as much of a balance as we can. Um, but, you know, we don't, we love doing, we love working in the education mm. sector. It's not like it's a, you know, it's a, it's a chore. chore. <laughs> um, it's, it's, we find it very interesting. So mm. um, we, we love the work. We love the, we have long-term clients. We have one client we've been working for for almost 20 years and we've must have delivered seven or eight projects for that that particular client. So you know there, there, there's that opportunity to forge those long term relationships. Yeah. There's there's the opportunity to consolidate your knowledge and you know carry on doing your research. So there's lots of advantages about being in one sector. But then you know it's also quite nice sometimes to think, oh, how might we get into that sector? And it's not easy because, for example, housing which we've never, you know, general public housing, mm. um, we've never really got into. And and that's because it's a kind of a closed shop. You know, there are lots of people who just do housing. And then when they go to that interview with a big commercial developer, whoever it might be, they you know, they can talk that language. Yeah. You've got to learn to speak the language, I think. And that's our, you know, that's, that's what we try and learn to do. 
when you've been diversifying the, the portfolio of, of work, has there also been a kind of challenge in terms of when you take on a new piece of work in a sector to keep that project profitable because there's a lot of, you know, research or there's a lot of kind Did of... Did you say profitable? <laughs> Sorry. So what? <laughs> what how, how, so how do, we, how, do we, how do we keep profitable? <laughs> Did you, did you, um, I, I don't, we don't know that word, do we? I think, do you know, we, I mean, the fact that we are still here 27, 28 years down yeah. the line means that we need to be profitable. Do, is making money the most important thing to us? No, actually it isn't. Is doing a jolly good job, making sure the client is happy, making sure the people who've worked on the project are happy, I mean, and making sure it's a project that we are proud of, regardless of what it is, that for me is the most important thing. If it doesn't lose money, I mean, I'm very happy. If it makes money, I'm ecstatic. (laughs) (laughs) But But we manage it quite carefully. Yeah. So we we, we aim to make a profit on all our projects. And we have a fee model um, that, you know, suggests that we make a certain percentage of profit on all our projects. Uh, and we try. We, we're quite good, actually, at um, managing the, the work within that fee, the, the agreed fee. So we try and agree realistic fees. We try not to lose money. We try and make, at least keep that little bit of profit that's kind of be- be- benchmarked, embedded, earmarked, embedded, embedded, embedded yeah. Yeah. into that project. And, and really, all we would have to do, all we have to do is make sure we don't lose money on any project, and then we'd be fine. But it just, you know, the geopolitical situation, Brexit, uh, pandemics... Um, it's been economic downturns yeah. can can get in the way, yeah. um, and you know we spend it. We we put whatever money we don't take out of the business as we, we try and pay uh, everyone a decent wage. Yeah. Then we put money into staff training, a lot of money. We put money into research. Uh, we put money into you know, yeah. IT infrastructure. We support. Um, we you know we we really good on supporting families. Mm. and young mothers and things like that things that because both of us have been kind of mothers we know how important that is so those kind of things which you don't really you you know you don't really see and touch as a profitability thing because actually that money's gone and Mm. you know enhanced pay enhanced kind of flexibility when you come back those those are the things that I think are really important yeah very important to us And, and it comes back to what we started talking about at the very beginning you know we've got people in our office who've been with us pretty much from day one um, who are now in their 50s you know they are um, they you know they might be facing other challenges now it's not so much child care or child you know maternity leave and child care it's things that you know you face later in your life so you know and we're very mindful of that so so you ask us about profitability and it's a very very good question Um, but when you're breaking into a new sector you know you have to do quite a lot of late work you have to do quite a lot of research you know nobody's going to give you that money back until you win your first sort of mm. big job in that sector mm-hmm. and then you maybe recoup some of that money but Ryan what we don't do is we don't have an entertaining budget um, where we are going and whining and dining or taking people to the rugby and whatnot that ca- that money goes into um, you know, Michelle would like securing, to. <laughs> <laughs> securing, <laughs> she's <not sorry. laughs> securing, you know, to put it going into securing new work in in different sectors or with challenging clients or you know things that we want to be doing. So, I think we we manage things slightly differently, maybe to other practices. Uh, what, what you're saying there as well about um, kind of reinvestment and also nurturing talent and retaining talent. What, what else would you say has been a success of the business in order to be able to, to do that? Because to keep people around for more than, you know, three, four Decades. years now, nowadays yeah. is, is, is really, really difficult. And this is something that so many practices struggle with. Hiring becomes harder and harder. Um, you know, this, our profession is, is pretty flawed, let's be honest. You know, um, it's we love what we do. You know, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't want to be anything other than an architect. But the profession has got, you know, quite a lot to answer for. Our practice is predominantly female, always has been. Started off at 100%. We've slipped down to about 80%. Um, it's, you know, we, architecture has predominantly been a place for wealthy, white, uh, male, mm-hmm. um, middle class people. 
we none of those things, you know. And so we we um we've always wanted to make this a safe place for people to work, and that isn't doesn't come easily, you know. Safe, I think more than safe. Try and make it a happy place. Interesting. Challenging. Try and make it a place where you're comfortable, where you're not overly, but somewhere that you know that we will support you. Respected. Res- incredibly respected. Mm. Yeah. I think... I, 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 and that I, probably sounds a bit sort of, you know, North London Guardian reading <laughs> lovely. And it, it probably does sound like that, because that probably is what it sounds like, but it's not... It's very genuine. Mm. You know, we have a... We have a, a really deep, serious commitment to our staff. Um, and, and to the kind of future of the practice. So, you know, we will, you know, at some point we'll hand over the practice and that, that's, you know, that's a long-term plan. Um, and we'll hand it over in good shape to people who will hopefully be, you know, wanting to take it on and, you know, um, not now, not for a while, not tomorrow, but, you know, we'd, we'd be irresponsible not to be thinking about that. You know. But, but more, um, more specifically... You know, we, we try and make sure that well, people never join us and kind of just go, okay, get on and do it. Right. You're always working under someone. Um, uh, you know, we try and make sure that people come to meetings and see the way those things happen, even though they're not contributing. So we train. We, we spend a lot of time training. And it's not just get your part three. It's this is how you behave this is how you respond. This is that's important for us as a practice to be seen, to be kind of supporting our clients, mm. contractors, other consultants in that kind of way. And I think hopefully that is what kind of carries the ethos of our business through to the people who come and work with us. Amazing. What's next? What's what's in store for <gasps> the rest of twenty 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 two? Yeah. Um, do you know what's what next? We, I mean, we. But that's a very good question. We, I suppose, we. You know, to be honest, we love what we do. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not planning to stop working anytime soon. Michelle's not either, unless you haven't told me something. <laughs> um, I'm just Breaking finishing a PhD, yeah. which I started ten years ago. Oh, congratulations! So that is a huge, big deal for me because I was about to pack it in about. Wow. At the beginning of lockdown, I just thought this is ridiculous, and then it, so I had a bit of a now or never chat to myself. In fact, I suggested to my supervisors that it was it, the never was more likely, and they were like, no. Ar- architecturally related. I'm yeah, assuming. yeah, yeah. What so was that, your that, what was your thesis on? Oh, it's um, it's on it's about collaboration and shared experience in the design process. And it's a bit more complicated than that. A little bit difficult to sum up in one sentence, but I can tell you more about <laughs> it. That's not part of this podcast. But um, we, I suppose, you know, we are, we are thinking about the future of the practice. We are thinking about models of practice. And that's something that's an active conversation that's ongoing. Um, we, we both would have, I think Michelle's got sort of sectors of work that she would like to work in. I have sectors of work that I'd like to work in. We, we talk about that all the time. Um, Outside of the education sector. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. We constantly um, monitoring where the practice is in terms of where our staff are and, you know, how they need to be uh, supported to, you know, be going out and getting work, say, for example. That's another conversation that's ongoing. Um, because so traditionally we've gone out and got the work, the we've work, led yeah. that, and we know, we, that needs to change. Yes. Um, but, um, yeah. I mean, you talk about business plans, and it's, it's a very interesting conversation. We started at the beginning talking about the idea of, of business planning. And we've done some of that as well. Um, but just a little example, you know, we, a couple of years ago, not very many years ago, we, we entered a lot of competitions or we pitched for a lot of master plans and not won any, or we just didn't win enough. And we were thinking, what are we doing wrong? You know, these people do all these master plans, win all these master plans, these people, what, we were looking at the, their websites, trying to think, what are they, you know, and we just thought, we just sort of sat down and thought, right, what do we need to do to make a good master plan? And the next couple of master plans we won, and so now we do quite a lot of master plans. In fact, we've done more than 30. So, you know, it's just, I think we've, we need to understand that when we put our focus on something and put our minds to something, we can we do it. successful. Um, and, and we need to do more of that, I think. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, um, yeah, I suppose the, the, 
the the art of running a practice has comes a bit more naturally to us now. You know, as as we said we, when we started, we never clue what we were doing. I think now we do actually. I think now we do know how to run a practice. Um, and I think the way next is is giving that um, that information that um, knowledge knowledge yeah. to the the people in our the office. next generation yeah. um, and 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 beyond. Actually, I don't think it's only everything. It shouldn't only be focused um, around. Yeah, I think around, that's yeah. a very good point. I think I think um, finding ways to disseminate that knowledge mm-hmm. through writing, teaching. Um, is is very important you know it's not much point if we keep it all to ourselves is it and i think that but what we would be speaking about is maybe a a business which is slightly different to a very um just a a business that's out there to make profit it's it's about maybe and it's the kind of catchphrase that everyone you know about a business that kind of embeds Mm well-being um into um people's lives but when we talk about this, people say, but how can you make any money? You know, that's all lovely, but that's not real, is it? I mean, that doesn't apply to the real world. Well, actually, it does. And it's probably, you know, the only way forward. I mean... For, for us. I for mean, us and, and probably for a lot of people. Else. You know, it's, um, it's, you know, we... Well, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, we've seen across the globe the kind of idea of the the great resignation and people kind of moving and not being fulfilled in their work and mm. it's a very clear indicator that purpose and belonging and culture are things that are actually the real drivers, drivers. and from, exactly. a, from a from a business perspective you know when when companies are lo- losing staff and there's high turnover and then the leadership sucks and there isn't a, there isn't a culture then exactly. you've got nobody you've got nothing to yeah. it's it becomes very difficult mm. and i think and, we always we always tread that very fine balance of mm. making sure, because I promise you our staff um, could probably go and get much higher paid jobs somewhere else, or mm-hmm. not much, but higher. Um, but they choose to stay with us mm-hmm. because of hopefully the, the environment that, that um, we are all, including them, creating. Um, and that has become much more important over the last couple of years. I think that's just come right up there. But I, I was telling Michelle this uh, the other day, I was talking to a a developer um, and well actually an architect who works predominantly for developers and the developer was there and we were about to go into a, a, a meeting and I we was say I said oh I think I, I sort of made it sort of off the cuff comment about the fact that I don't really speak developer and I was said I, you know I think I need some lessons on how to I don't I don't know if I speak this language and and this architect said to me, oh, but I'd kill for your portfolio. Mm. And I said, oh, really? That's nice, kind of you to say, but why? And he said, well, I bet you you haven't got any skeletons in your cupboard. And I said, well, no, not many, actually. <laughs> and he said, he said, well, I've got, you know, the, the projects that earn us the money, we don't, 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 aren't on our website. Mm. Um, whereas I said, he said, I bet you you put all your projects on your website. And I said, yeah, we do. Some of them haven't quite made it yet because they're in the queue. But yeah, we well, do. some have been on yeah. and we've just said, oh, my God, they're a bit old now. But, you know, maybe we need to <laughs> but, start. You know, and, and so that's, that, that, and that's a big difference too. You know, mm-hmm. we don't, um, when you, you know, when you want your projects to be a success and you want them to, you know, you want, you, you want your, the end users, the people using those buildings to love those buildings, love mm-hmm. working and living in those buildings. That takes a bit of effort and commitment. You know, you don't just hand over the keys and walk away. Um, you know, I, we've, we did a Buddhist retreat a couple of years ago, which has been the, one of the central projects of this thesis that I've just written. The clients are our friends, you know, literally. I mean, we, we, we're in contact with them. We stay in contact with them. You know, again, back to the kind of lovey bit, but it's true. <laughs> it's kind of, and it works. It's not you know, getting nurturing your clients and having good long term relationship with your with your clients isn't just a nice idea. Mm-hmm. It, it, it 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 pays it, back. It, yeah. it pays back, and it leads to repeat work. And actually, turnover is as important to us as cash flow. You know, keeping the business, keeping the work coming in, and keeping the business the people busy and occupied is is very important to us. So that's our kind of, that's the... I love it. Yeah. (laughs) Great.
Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your, your story, your expertise and your insights into the art of running a practice. Brilliant. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.